In the fall of 1890, famous fur hunter Donald McKenzie entered a camp of 10,000 Shoshone, Paiute, and Bannock along the Boise River. The camp was seven miles long, located on both sides of the river, and reached from Table Rock to Eagle Island. The original people had congregated for social and economic changes between the closely related Nubic language tribes. Remnants of this group now live on the Duck Valley Indian Reservation. Before other peoples came, they shared this land. Before maps divided the lands and policies confined First Nations to the reservations, the Shoshone and Paiute peoples shared the resources that became the tri-state area of Idaho, Oregon, and Nevada. Historically, the bands of the Duck Valley Reservation utilized the area of the Snake River Plain north to the Sawtooth Mountains from New Meadows and Hell's Canyon, west to the Malheur River area in Oregon, and south to the Humboldt River area in Nevada. While the bands of both tribes moved around the region, in these lands they would come together as the patterns of hunting and gathering brought them to the same place as the cycle of time played out as the Creator had intended. Let me explain first that the Shoshone Paiute tribes are several tribes that were brought here on this reservation. First of all, there was the Western Shoshones from the south in, in Nevada, and that was where the, the, this reservation first was set aside for the Western Shoshone people. And then there were the Paiute people that were moved here by treaty from the Paradise Valley, Winnemucca area. And then also after the Bannock War of 1878 came the Northern Paiute people after their re release from Fort Simcoe, Washington and Yakima. And also there's the Boise and the Bruno Valley Shoshone that came here and some of our people uh, now reside in the Fort Hall area. And, and a lot of our people were up in the Salmon River area as well, and they are referred to as the Lemhi people. In our oral histories, our people roamed throughout our homeland. We, state lines did not exist at that time. And of course, when the, when the salmon were running, a lot of our people were attracted to the Snake River, and in the wintertime, they went down there because up here, we're about 3,000 feet higher. So many times nowadays when we talk with agencies and states, they, they refer to us as different people, but in reality we're all related in, in some way. A lot of the people were pushed in different directions. Uh, people from Weezer area, Boise Valley area, a lot of them went to Fort Hall. A lot of them came here. And as I say, the Northern Paiutes came here. So that's how we ended up here on, on the Duck Valley Reservation as the Shoshone Paiute tribes, but uh, we are, of course, Shoshone Paiute people, but we all came from different areas. Once the non-Indians came to their lands, the Shoshone and Paiute had similar unfortunate experiences as other tribal groups with these new peoples. The travelers on the Oregon Trail, as well as the California Trail, cut through their territories, devastating the land and resources of the tribes. When these uh, non-Indian people got to uh, a place called uh, Three Island Crossing on the Snake River, um, these folks were really in terrible, terrible shape. And our people uh, helped them, you know, uh, took care of them. And our uh, way of medicine and lifestyle helped them to survive and brought them along where they continued on into Oregon. And a lot of them stayed throughout the uh, Snake River Plain and the Boise uh, Bruno Valley areas. Frequent confrontations occurred during the immigration and ultimate occupation of prime lands of the region. The discovery of gold in the Boise Basin brought a flood of miners in 1862. In 1863, Fort Boise was constructed and the city of Boise sprang up. The Treaty of Fort Boise was signed on October 10, 1864, which granted the Boise River Valley to the settlers. The Bruno Valley Treaty of April 12, 1866, 
ceded most all of Southwest Idaho Territory to the United States. During this period, vigilantes had placed a bounty on Indian scalps and hunting Indians became the order of the day in February of 1866. $100 for each male scalp, $50 for a female scalp, and $25 for each child scalp. And we became uh, involved in what's called the Bannock War of 1878. Everybody that was involved in that war, the only way that they survived was uh, through the Owyhee Canyon land. It became a sanctuary for uh, our people to survive because of uh, the, the great difficulty that the military had trying to flush our people out of those areas. And we were able to stay alive uh, because of those lands. And they're very important to us at this point in time as uh, sacred areas. The Western Shoshone of Northern Nevada signed a peace treaty in 1863 which allowed for the traversing and settlement of lands in the Nevada Territory. The Western Shoshone were granted Duck Valley as their reservation in 1877. Duck Valley was historically a joint use area of the Shoshone and Paiute. Nearly a decade later the Paiute joined them on the reservation following release from a prisoner of war camp as a result of participation in the Bannock War of 1878. There was uh, very horrible things that happened to our people, such as uh, they, they had uh, stuck two American flags in the ground and forced our people to march uh, between them after they had skewered the children, babies, on those flags, those flagpoles, and our people had to walk through that. Uh, you know, to uh, for the military to let them know that if they tried anything on that force march, you know, that uh, death would be the end result for them. A lot of our people uh, suffered terribly. The elders that fell on the trail where our people weren't allowed to help them or pick them up. They could only be forced to jump over them, step over them. And they were left there to, uh, to die, to freeze to death. And that's what happened when uh, the people got to uh, uh, Fort Simcoe. They were held there for a little over five years as prisoners of war. And uh, out of uh, uh, roughly 700 people, I think 175 or 80 uh, made it out of there alive. Uh, upon their release, uh, the, uh, there was another executive order that was uh, signed to establish the Idaho side of the Duck Valley Indian Reservation. And those folks that were released from Fort Simcoe were directed to go to Duck Valley and uh, start their lives over there. Several bands of both Shoshone and Paiute are represented on the reservation, and each is related to peoples on other Paiute and Shoshone reservation sites. In 1934, the tribal government was organized and its constitution adopted two years later. We're established under the Indian Reorganization Act and through that system, uh, we have an elected body of six councilmen and a, and a chairman that's elected every three years. And uh, basically, uh, we're the legislative branch of, of the government. We have uh, a, a tribal administration, uh, health administration, judicial administration, and uh, we oversee all, these, all of these programs. Two factors that help the Shoshone and Paiute are their active and proactive tribal government and their control of natural resources on the Duck Valley Reservation. 20 years ago, our tribal government didn't, didn't have very much, just a, a few programs. But since the establishment of the uh, Indian Self-Determination Act, we've been able to expand uh, three, four, five-fold maybe in, the, in employment and became the, the largest employer. The biggest change that I saw happened when our tribe entered into self-governance compact agreements with, uh, for all the BIA programs and the Indian Health Service programs. Not only was more funding available for employment, but it seemed like we uh, came into a new era of uh, administration also. We've got a, a fairly large reservation, all tribally owned, 450, close to 460 square miles. That's basically all held in common for tribal members. 
It was called Duck Valley for a reason. It basically, after it came out of the mouth of the canyon, it funneled out and it was basically one big giant marsh. The reservation is a beautiful landscape of valleys and mountain ranges. Wild Horse Reservoir and the Duck Valley Irrigation Project, established in the 1930s, increased opportunities for both farming and ranching in the area. You know, there are sciences out there that we're not able to tap. And in order for our agriculturists to be better producers and to help our economy, we have to find better ways of getting the water to them or helping them with animal sciences. And I think technology is the way. The reservation is host to a significant number of tourists year-round who come for fishing, hunting, and other recreational activities. Three reservoirs and the Owyhee River provide fishing access licensed by the tribes. The salmon that used to come up through the Owyhee River, some of the old documents we've seen that the, the people used to, to just get salmon almost by the wagon loads to take up and sell to the non-Indian people. And, uh, you know, there was a time that salmon was, salmon was so plentiful that they couldn't even imagine a day when, when it would run out. We had uh, some of the largest spring chinook runs of salmon at one time. When the salmon left, so did a lot of our species. Uh, so uh, we're trying to bring them back through uh, uh, the bureaucracy of science, let's say. But right now we probably have, uh, out of Idaho's sensitive list of 70-some creatures, we probably have over 60 of them here on the reservation. I noticed that a lot of things are coming back that were once here before. Uh, Wolverine are back. Uh, of course, we've got a lot of badgers. The skunk's back. Uh, and again, you know, sightings of black bear back up higher. But uh, we've got a lot of elk, which were native to uh, the area. We've got an atrocious amount of antelope. I know we did a flyover at one time, and we probably counted uh, right around 2,800 head. Tribal government and programs provide much of the employment on the reservation. The tribes operate a modern hospital facility that they share with non-Indian residents of the area. Ranching and agriculture are also part of the reservation economy. Tribal youth attending kindergarten through high school system are a pride of the community. Other programs include a tribal court system, environmental protection, social services, a senior citizen center, a Head Start program, economic development, and resource management. I think the, the primary a source of employment for the community is government. Bureau of Indian Affairs is the next uh, largest employer, and then the school district uh, at the school. And outside of that, the, the, the other uh, primary uh, industry is agriculture, farming and ranching. When I first started with the tribe, we had about 40 employees. This was back in the early 1980, right around there. And now we're up to 200, but there's still room for more. We provide protection for approximately 400 structures. Um, our wildland crew consists of two camp crews and two hand crews. Uh, we send them out over all the western states. In the past few years, our development on the reservation as you know, it, it's coming out pretty good and there's a lot of new houses and such, which in turn we have to uh, provide the protection for these facilities. So this is a tribally operated hospital which uh, provides the basic services that the Indian Health Service would, meaning it does have an outpatient services, it has inpatient, community health, behavioral health. It has its own EMS service, which most rural hospitals and tribal operations don't have. So this community is very privileged to have an emergency services like it does right now. It employs approximately 80 employees, both locally and professionals who come from all over the nation to work here. You don't see a facility like this in other rural communities, which I think speaks tremendous uh, cooperation that was within this and still is within this community. The tribes seek mitigation of lands outside their boundaries that are rightfully theirs. Lands that were taken and occupied, 
but never legally ceded by the tribes. That treaty uh, to this day is, is still being argued because our people, Western Shoshone people, f feel that, uh, that the land still belongs to, to the Western Shoshone people. And uh, it's uh, been quite a battle that we've had to uh, try to make the federal government acknowledge that and uphold the, the promises that were within the, the treaty. The successful reclamation of an old copper mine upstream of the reservation is a major environmental concern of the tribes. The mine leaches acid drainage into the Owyhee River, the major source of water for the reservation. It produces acid mine drainage, which hits a creek down here called Mill Creek, which runs directly into the Owyhee River. The Owyhee River then flows down to the Duck Valley Indian Reservation, and it recharges our groundwater. So we have many, many concerns with this site. The people here on this reservation are heavily dependent upon fish, and cattle ranching is the main form of income. So when you've got these metals coming into the river, it's got several pathways that it can get into the cattle, and it goes up and up through the food chain until it finally hits the tribal people. We use the water for ceremonial purposes. Women gather the willow materials which grow in the river, which baby baskets are made of. So we're looking at a direct pathway which might affect our most vulnerable population. We feel we're on a, a positive process here. Right now, we're more or less um, in negotiations with the state and these mining companies, but we're gonna come to a final remedy, and I'm positive that it will eventually come to total and full cleanup of this site. These challenges are being met by the Shoshone Paiute with wisdom and foresight. They are active in seeking partnerships with other sovereigns, including the United States, to help provide for their current and future needs. I think the goals for the tribe is to uh, establish an economic base that is going to allow us to participate in the American dream. You know, to own your home, to own some land, and to be able to uh, raise your children, educate them to a level to where that, you know, they're a good part of the community, a positive part of the community. We're starting development on a $3 million store complex that's going to also have uh, area available for uh, tribal members that want to establish a business. We're hoping to get the bank set up in there in the post office and uh, have a little truck stop along with it. We're going to start a gaming venture. We're currently in negotiations with the governor of Nevada. We purchased what we call our tribal ranch consisting of uh, about 280 acres along with 200 head of mother cows that we're, we run up there and, and sell the calves. It's an area that is uh, very capable of, of having a uh, destination resort developed out there in a beautiful area with the Owyhee River running right through it. You know, I want to uh, see us as a tribe be able to develop jobs so they can stay on the reservation, you know, and they can live there and raise their families in this beautiful place that we've made basically out of nothing. This tribe is trying very hard to make sure that the cornerstones of our society are intact and will be productive, such as our court system, our law enforcement, uh, bringing more education um, opportunities to the reservation, health care, you know, that our sciences in, in the health field will be better to, to provide better services to our people. It's, to me, uh, it is the remotest reservation in the continental United States, and uh, to me it's God's country. We do have several uh, Christian denominations of churches on the reservation, but we also have uh, our traditional religion that is still alive on the reservation pertaining to the sweat lodge ceremony, the uh, Sundance ceremony, and the Native American church. We gave up a lot when we gave up our homelands. We lost a way of life. We have lost much. And our tribal sovereignty is, is the one thing we still hang on to, and I. I certainly hope that uh, our future leaders continue to hold tribal sovereignty as number one to be protected. In many ways, the partnerships of the Shoshone and Paiute peoples is as old as the mountains surrounding Duck Valley. Because of their forward-focused leadership, it is also as new as the information age of the 21st century. By working together, these people can and will ensure a successful and prosperous future for their descendants.